G'day guys, um, this is on energy and on the differences between fat and carbohydrates in terms of energy. And so we'll do a bit of a comparison. You know, when you look at uh, kilocalories, which is pretty much the measurement of heat, when you put something in a bomb calorimeter, and then that energy is dissipated into the water, that photonic energy, and it sort of vibrates those molecules of water, and that increases their temperature by a certain amount. That is what a um, such a device then measures to work out the amount of kilocalories. That is fine if you are a uh, you know, steam engine and you consume coal. Um, you know, nothing wrong with coal. It's good stuff. It creates a lot of energy, keeps a lot of lights on um, around the world. It's something that the crackpot um, climate um, buffoons seem to forget. But uh, let's move away from that. Pretty much we're talking about here the sort of energy that is actually produced in our bodies by our actual bodies when it actually ingests uh, certain types of foods and primarily the two main energy sources are fat and carbohydrates. Protein is sort of an emergency energy source, you could say. You only really break down muscle or utilize protein when you've run out of the other two um, and at that stage, you well, we've seen people in starvation mode um, in the past in different parts of the world, um, and it looks pretty grim, but that's what happens. Then you start wasting away, and you've got very little energy to move around. You just sit in a place, wasting away, and until death. But when we look at the kilocalories, and we go nine divided by four, we get something like 2.25 fold difference in terms of heat that would be. Um, and so many people think, oh, well, it's 2.25 times more energy you get out of um, fat compared to carbohydrates. That's in terms of heat. Yes. If you're a bomb calorimeter, that's the amount you would get. Okay, humans are not bomb calorimeters, they're not closed systems, they are open systems, and they are hormonal systems that regulate substrates of energy. So those substrates can, depending on um, what hormonal reactions are taking place, can either be stored, utilized, or wasted as uncoupling of mitochondria. So all three possibilities are there. Um, and something that a bomb calorimeter cannot do, all those three things. Anyway, because it's just the way, the nature of the beast. Now, talking about um, the calorie sort of situation, even that is a lot of nonsense. I'll give an example. Why well, doesn't make sense? Just one simple example. If you put cocoa... Um, into a bomb calorimeter. Now that's highly saturated, um, which is the cacao that's based, that you create um, the chocolate, the different types of chocolates. If you put that in a bomb calorimeter, you will actually get an energy level in terms of kilocalories of 5.5, not nine, 5.5. So the difference there would be if you got 5.5, divide that by, by 4, it's 1.375 difference. So that's the sort of why it makes no sense. And, you know, seed oil has a sort of most of the PUFA sort of stuff because it's higher in PUFA, has about 9.1. And that's where it's based because most of the most of the fats that have been replaced in the human diet in a sand diet are seed oils, and they have um, they've actually tested seed oils, so they have an approximate around nine, you know, so it's about nine point one four uh, omega sixes. But you know, the general seed oils in general, they've sort of averaged it out to nine 
as a rough sort of uh, measure. It's not an accurate, even protein. He's 4.44, not four. They just ran it off to four. It's con for convenient purposes. You know, so these measurements are all inaccurate. The round, the round, round off, let alone our bodies do not behave like bomb calorimeters. And we know this from, you know, old German research that was done in humans, not rats, um, but in humans, actual humans. And we know that they were actually being fed at a certain rate in clinical settings. And they could see that somebody who could not produce any insulin, who was diabetes one, they could actually consume a massive amount of energy. The only problem that what would happen when they did that, they would get a very substantial rise in ketones and, and also a certain rise in sugar as well, So, which is what we call ketoacidosis. Okay, so that's what would, would happen. But they would not put any fat. They couldn't store it because with that insulin, you can't store it. Now, insulin is an anabolic hormone, but it does a lot of other things as well. It's, you know, it still drives, it, it signals to muscle cells for protein synthesis. You don't need a lot. I've actually shown that with a leucine um, video that I've done and covered that. But it has a certain level of signaling that it does. And that signaling um, has a number of roles, hormonal roles in the body. When it's lower, um, it allows other hormones like hormone sensitive lipase and many other things to activate um, and you know open up the flood rates of free fatty acids to flow out of the fat cells so you can utilize that energy. Um, but that's if uh, you know you're fasting and stuff like that and your insulin is much lower or you're on a sensible diet, um, a human based diet, a species appropriate diet, and you'll be running lower insulin. So between meals, you will be oxidizing your own adipose um, fat stores. Anyway, let's get on and look at this study about real energy. What does the body use? Ah, yes. Anybody worth their knows that energy comes in the form of ATP from oxidative phosphorylation. That's what a, where most of our energy comes from in the mitochondria. How does the ratio of ATP yield from complete oxidation of pyrimidic acid and that of glucose compared with the relative energy content of fat and carbohydrate? This is an Australian study that was done in, nine, in back in the 90s, the University of Sydney. Pretty much, I'll just read the abstraction. The author of many recent popular textbooks of biochemistry quote values of the energy content of triglycerol and dry carbohydrates on the weight basis, as well as presenting calculations for the yield of ATP obtained when molecules of glucose or palmitic acid are completely oxidized to CO2 and water. By extending these calculations and computing the yield of ATP in terms of the weight of glucose and palmitic acid, the CO2 and H2O, it can be shown that the value for the ratio of the energy content of fat to carbohydrate is almost identical to the yield of the ratio of the yield of ATP per gram of palmitic acid oxidized compared with that of glucose. So now they are in this study using palmitic acid, which is what, if you take, um, if you've got excess carbohydrates, the body will actually convert all that into palmitic acid, which is 16 carbon long, um, long chain fat. And it will store it in that format because it actually can cleave it off and create ketone bodies as well with four carbon lengths. So it's very useful. Also, it's used in a number of tissues around the body, including lung surfactant, which is a combination of palmitic acid and choline. So that is why eat your eggs, little kitties, um, and get enough of those two lovely nutrients from animal foods to have good gas exchanges in your lungs. 
Anyway, let's move on. Therefore, the efficacy on a per base, per gram basis by which energy is made available as ATP is comparable for both the oxidation of fat and carbohydrates, thus underscoring the fact that catabolic pathways for both fat and carbohydrate use, ultimately use the same means of generating ADP, namely oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, we'll move along. Now, the key arguments here is to basically talk about, you know, going through, I'm not going to sort of discuss all this, you know, the author of the textbooks quote above, present calculation of yield of ATP um, obtained, a um, molecule of glucose or palmate is completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. Now, it is surprising that most of these authors do not use the results of these calculations to compute the yield of ATP in terms of the weight of glucose and palmitic oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. Such a simple extension of the calculations would reinforce the statement made in the previous paragraph too, pointing out that the efficacy of which energy is made available is ATP. So they're just arguing, you know, it's it, it's ATP, guys. You know, this energy sort of stuff. Um, we sometimes use it like kilojoule type energy, which is sort of uh, um, used in that regard. So I'll just put that up here. 37 divided by 16 yields a 2.3 type thing. Remember, 9 divided by 4, the calorie nonsense is 2.25, which is way out in terms of what really happens. And then 37 divided by 16 is 2.3, which is they're using the kilojoules um, per gram. So they're looking at kilojoules per gram. That's it. And they're going, no, 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 guys, really, it is these, you know, because they're actually saying up here, the following calculations make use of a more recent figure of 2.5 molecules of ATP formed per molecule of mitochondrial NADH oxidized by the, that's hydrogen, just for those who want to know, by the electron transport chain and is coupled to oxidative phosphorylation and 1.5 moles of ATP form per molecule of enzyme bound FADH2 oxidized by the same process. Remember, all these are enzymes that are basically moving electrons across and all that. But anyway, for the complete oxidation of glucose to carbon dioxide and water, either 30 to 32 molecules of ATP can be formed, depending on the on whether the cytosolic NADH is oxidized via glycerol phosphate um, shuttle or the malate aspate shuttle. I'm not going to get into that, but to, you know, respectively. For the complete oxidation of palmitic acid, 106 molecules of ATP can be formed if we average the ATP yield for glucose and use the value of 31 ATP. So that's averaging between the two. Then on, an, on a weight basis, we find that 0 0.70 molecules of ATP and 0 0.41 molecules of ATP are formed from one gram of glucose, one gram of parbenic acid are completely oxidized, respectively. So, and he's saying thus the ratio of the yield of ATP per gram of parbenic acid oxidized to the glucose oxidized is 2.4, thus over twice as much in it chemical energy in the form of ATP is obtained per gram of palmitic acid, then is completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water compared with oxidizing glucose. So they're trying to correct the um, the situation and say, well, hold on, You've got to measure ATP, you know, what's being produced, actual stuff that the body's going to use. Oops, sorry, not that. <laughs> 
41 divided by 0.17 and we get 2.4 plus. So that is the amount based on the on the weight basis of what we're actually oxidizing, actual stuff oxidizing, material oxidizing, is that's the difference, 2.4. Okay? So you can actually see just trying to measure with, you know, kilocalories is going to be, is way off. It's wrong in many respects. So let alone when we take into consideration things like hormones, uncoupling of mitochondria in a low fat or low low carbohydrate, like high, you know, when you go like a very high keto um, type of ketosis, go very low fat or very low carb, you can actually get some level of uncoupling as well. So you get a lot of, and these are driven by hormones and stuff like that. So measuring things of energy you know, this is basic reductionist measurements to say, hold on, between the two, the ratio is 2.4. But that ignores completely the hormonal system, as I've just pointed out, and a whole lot of other things. And where the stuff goes. Okay, you produce, you're producing certain energy that's coming in at a certain, so you can work at the rate at the mitochondria but the energy actually coming in and, and crossing the enteric system, your gut lining, where does that go? That's actually directed and controlled by hormones. So even in that case, these ratios will not tell you what ratio of energy is going to be produced in the mitochondria between the two, these di different substrates. Depends what gets into either either cell before the Randall cycle gradient is activated at a certain gradient and a certain duration. So it's all, it's a complicated um, situation. This is just to basically give you guys an understanding of energy that is produced inside the body from molecules of sugar, and molecules of fat what we what the what the sort of yield that we get comes out of them you know and showing quite clearly that even kilojoules is out calories is definitely out by a, a quite a bit of a margin but also you know one is a measurement of of heat the other is a is an inaccurate measurement as well of energy content Again, it's nonsense. It's really at the end of the day is, is ATP. What is the actual comp amount of ATP being produced by the different stuff? And that's not even taking into consideration the actual hormonal interplay. So you can actually see how the whole concept of calories, the whole concept of energy in the body is very hard to calculate. And I agree with Bart completely on this. It is impossible to calculate. So you have to eat the species appropriate food that will give you the signaling. And we know that animal foods give you a higher level of satiety than sugar. So they tell you, look, you're full. Stop eating. If you guzzle down sugar, you don't get that message let alone your insulin is going up, then, then, then falling down. After two hours, you get a hypoglycemic shock and you're looking around and going like a, like a feral, you know, crazy animal. Where is my, where is my next, um, uh, you know, meal? And every two hours, you're running to the trough and sticking your head into it and sucking up all those lollipops, sugary lollipops, you know. And if you if you if you if you're one of those people that suck on things like um, Duchette's type of uh, you know it's a very atrophic you know very don't try one of those <laughs> definitely don't try one of those you know it says steroid affected <laughs> apparently you know that's what he was in for from what Bart tells me um, and showed some evidence last uh, not in this one but the previous video that I'd seen of him so yes those 
idiots that sort of believe low IQ, basically people that still believe in calories being a measurement of energy in the body. It's not. It's ATP. But even ATP, this is reductionism, can only tell you what you can actually yield from a specific substrate of energy. But it can't tell you exactly where it's going to go, how it's going to be utilized in the body. It's a whole lot of hormones, your physical activity, your behavior, everything. Is your system functioning properly or deranged? So you're getting wrong signaling. There are so many moving parts. It's a complex um, web of interactions of a whole lot of systems and signaling pathways that uh, most of these people have got no idea and it won't even tell you because they're selling a product, they're selling a concept, a construct, which tends to bring down, have what are, what we call repeat customers. It's a bit like, you know, the real estate game or, or a lot of this sort of stuff. You know, if you look at the end of a real estate boom, what happens? All these seminars to try and suck people in. It's again the same just before the collapse of the stock market. They're trying to offload all their garbage to, you know, to people that are unaware of what's happening. You see it at every single moment. It's again, these sort of people, it's, you know, repeat customers, you know, yo-yo dieting. We know it. It's good money. And actually, you know, you blame the person who fails, who, you know, stuffs up their metabolism by doing these stupid, um, ridiculous diets by calorie restricting and affecting their metabolism. Yeah, they lose a bit of weight and then they just pack it on even quicker and then they basically blame themselves. And these people say, well, if you did it wrong, you know, here's a new supplement, here's a new miracle thing. You can take this supplement, take that, and if you combine this, you'll you'll you, um, you'll achieve your goals. And it's just a merry-go-round of exploitation of vulnerable people that are in a food in a, in a toxic food environment and have no idea how bad things are. And all we see every year on, year out, the let the rates of obesity keep rising and the rates of you know, chronic health um, issues keep going up. This model is unsustainable in the long run and we need to call it out. And I'm happy to call myself a friend of Barquet's because he's a, a non-honest scientist who basically told academia and walked out on them. He wasn't prepared to be bullied into doing pseudoscience or supporting pseudoscience. He walked out of that industry and said, I'm going to tell people exactly what's happening and how they're being deceived. And he's done a good job in that regard. Unfortunately, on the the YouTube censors, you know, um, don't appreciate that because truth nowadays in our society is does affect profits, does affect interests of certain groups in the in the society. You know, big pharma, big agra, these sort of people who like the profit margins from refined sugars and oils and love the after effects, which is the medicalization of the consequences of that sort of garbage, high deuterium garbage and highly processed lack of any, you know, much nutrients, very minimal nutrients and a lot of primary and secondary oxidative products that tend to do a lot of damage in the body, um, which then pharmaceutical companies come to the rescue for stabilizing markers. That means markers, they lower certain markers or make certain markers look good in a test, but your health continues to deteriorate. And all you end up over one or two decades is a bag full of meds, very expensive meds. That isn't a solution and a way of living. A chronic debilitating state of affairs for larger and larger amounts of the population. This nonsense about calories, this nonsense that is out there about, you know, is really harming people. And we need and it needs to stop. And we've pretty much had enough of it. And we're going to call it out and keep on calling it out. And try and explain to people and get through the message that the way they're calculating stuff is irrelevant, is a joke. They need to listen to their body. They need to eat species appropriate foods that give them the satiety signals and actually down regulate the derangements that are caused 
by the current current food environment and the stuff that they're doing to themselves. Anyway, that's it. Have a good day.